Sable, synthetic, nylon, taclon, golden taclon, camel hair, squirrel hair, goat, pony, fan brushes, flats, brights, riggers, and rounds. How do you know what brushes to choose, what brushes work best for you, and how to equip yourself with the right brushes when you're first starting out? As time goes on, you will settle on some favorite brushes that will become your absolute go-to. And depending on your style, you'll be able to select brushes that speak to the language that you use the most when painting. But until that time comes, it can be really challenging when faced with such a selection of brushes at an art supply store. So this video, I hope, demystifies some of that and answers some of your questions. This video is part of a series that I have been releasing, so be sure to look at the description below. And if you want to start at the beginning, the videos are all listed in order just to make things nice and easy for you. And in this video, I'll be sharing all of my tips and tricks on how to choose the right paintbrush for your next watercolor painting. And if you have any questions, please comment below and I'll be sure to answer them. Let's have a closer look at the anatomy of the brush. This is, as one would expect, this is called the tip. And then the center part, especially when you're looking at uh, round brushes, this is called the belly. And the metal part is a ferrule. With a flat brush, we have the blade here, which gives you that sharp edge once it's wet. And this, in this case, where there's a slight bend in the ferrule, this is called the heel. Once again, this brush is from my line of brushes and I always request to have them manufactured with the double crimp. And that keeps the head on and um, you won't run into any trouble. Now, when choosing a good quality brush, you wanna make sure that the ferrule is crimped twice. This keeps the head from popping off and it should be firm. If it feels loose at all in the store, then you know um, that you might not have a good quality brush on your hand. So that's something to look for. Give it a little twist to see if it feels loose or wobbly and definitely look for a double crimped ferrule brush. You want to also make sure that your bristles, especially when um, choosing a brush that's very, very plush like this, you want to make sure that if you just tug at them, that none of the bristles come out in your hand. If they come out in your hand in the store, you can be sure that they're going to be all over your painting once the brush is wet. Something to look for in a fan brush is one that stays splayed and spiky and doesn't clump together when you're working with it. The two main characteristics that you should identify when purchasing a brush are brushes that have um, ability to hold a lot of paint or water in the belly of the brush and brushes that spring back to a good point when you're painting. That's particularly important when you are doing precise work. Natural hair brushes hold more paint and water, but not all come to a good point. Synthetic brushes hold less paint and water, but do retain their shape. A good quality hybrid pure Kalinske brush offers both qualities, but they are a little bit of an investment. The reason why you want a brush to hold a lot of paint or water is because watercolor paint dries quite quickly on the surface. And the last thing you want to be doing is struggling with leaving your paper to reload your brush as the paint is drying on the surface. You want a brush that holds a lot of paint and water so that you can continue to work on the surface without that disruption. One question that I get asked frequently is how can you tell the difference at the art supply store between a synthetic brush and a natural hairbrush? I'm going to show you a few characteristics to look for that might give you a good indication if the sales associate at your local art supply store is not as knowledgeable as you would like. So one thing with a synthetic brush, also known as a nylon brush, they may look a lot like a natural hairbrush. You can just run a little test to see how shiny these bristles are. So you can just bend the brush a little bit and if it's super duper glossy and looks something like a Barbie hair, then you know that it's uh, an acrylic bristle or a synthetic brush. That might not hold a lot of water or paint. 
Now comparing the amount of shine to a natural hairbrush, the natural hairbrushes are a little bit duller. They don't have that high glossy look to the bristle. And you can see that the bristles are much more irregular in color and it doesn't look as tidy. Um, it looks a little bit fluffy, a little bit disheveled, but rest assured when it's wet, it will come to a beautiful point and that blade will sharpen right up. So let's have a look just side by side here. You can see how smooth and consistent the coloring is in the synthetic brush and how irregular and a little bit more mottled the look of the bristles are in the natural hairbrush. Let's compare the function of natural versus synthetic hairs. Here's three brushes, one full natural squirrel hairbrush, a synthetic brush, and then my blend of Kalinsky sable and um, half nylon or synthetic hair. And we're gonna just compare to see how much each of these brushes hold. So I will wet my brush first and we will start with the natural hair brush, which is the so-called squirrel hair brush. So as you can see, this brush soaks up a ton of paint and it has a huge belly. So I already know that this brush is probably going to outlast the other two, but we can put it to the test here. So it's still going. <laughs> and again, great for blocking in areas, um, but we've got that funny little bent molded shape to it, which indicates that it's not springing back to its point. So while it has quite a, a nice edge to it, this is used more for spontaneous strokes and for people who like to paint quickly. By contrast, I will use my hybrid blend, so a blend of Kalinsky sable bristles and nylon hair. And this brush comes to a good point and holds a fair amount of paint. I've tried to load it right up to the ferrule, so it's super saturated. I've soaked up as much paint as I possibly can. You can see has no problem holding its shape. Still has a ways to go before it dries out. So that is quite a lot of paint that this brush is able to hold. It's still going. <laughs> And finally, we will look at the pure nylon hair or synthetic bristle brush. So same thing, wet the brush, soak up as much paint as I can right to the ferrule. And you can see it's already starting to dry out. learned here is that while the synthetic brush does spring back to a good point and it's a wonderful brush for beginners um, because it's budget friendly it does not hold as much paint as the natural hair brushes this squirrel hair brush again is a fairly budget friendly brush um, it holds an incredible amount of water but it does not spring back to a point as you can see when it's wet it just sort of stays molded and it's got its own purposes and um, there's a lot of joy and fun to be had with a squirrel brush of this type. However, if you are looking for a brush that you have a little bit more control over, this might not be the brush for you. And while most people, when they're starting out, can't afford a pure Kalinsky sable brush, a hybrid brush is a nice alternative. It has a blend of those uh, nylon hair bristles mixed with sable 
red sable or Kalinsky sable um, bristles. And as we learned in the video, it springs back to a good point and it holds a lot of paint and water. So um, for me, this is my go-to brush for a number of reasons. One, it's fairly large. It has a nice generous belly, but it comes to an incredible point. So although it is a little bit on the higher end in the um, 65 to $70 range, um, this brush is like having three brushes in one. It's like having a number 10, a number six or eight, and then almost like a number three or a two um, because of the size of the point. I love this brush so much because it just saves me a ton of time and efficiency is really key when uh, painting in watercolor. Now there are so many different types of synthetic brushes on the market. There's gold and sable like this brush dyed to look like a natural hairbrush um, and see that it it has this beautiful progression of gold to the darker tip. So it's doing a really good impression of a natural hairbrush. Anything by the name of golden sable or golden taclon is not a natural hair. So watch out for um, brushes that might be misleading using that terminology. We also have white taclon. The taclon brushes are really, really fine, even though they are nylon or synthetic hairs. They're very, very fine. Um, and this is a beautiful choice for a wash brush, especially in this size, because you don't want to um, certainly invest necessarily in a $200 brush. If you're getting a natural hair brush like a Kalinsky Sable in a two inch, uh, that will probably bust your budget. Some brushes in your toolbox may be unconventional choices in watercolor. In this case, this is my half inch ivory short flat and it is synthetic and nylon, but it's almost as stiff as a hog's hair brush and it's very, very smooth. The bristles are extremely resilient. So I use this brush a lot for um, lifting techniques and scrubbing anytime I wanna lift off the stain. This ivory bristle is much more coarse than the fine taclon hair here and they all have different purposes and functions. So it's important to have a really nice variety of bristles in your uh, brush kit. This is a golden taclon and it definitely isn't trying to give the impression of a natural hairbrush. Um, you can see how bright orange it is. So it does already look a little bit more artificial. Again, perfectly suited for beginners, nice and budget friendly. And even though this is a smaller um, flat, it's quite plush, so that's something you want to look for. Uh, you want to make sure that there are enough bristles there, especially because it's synthetic. You want to be able to hold as much paint and water as possible. Friends, if you are enjoying this absolutely free content, I would love if you could click that super thanks button located right below this video box. It helps to support me and allows me to keep providing free content for you. In this section of our video, we're gonna look at all these different shapes of brushes and the function, what they all mean, what they all do. So this is a mop brush and you can see it has a really nice soft dome shape to it. And it is um, great for blocking in large areas, working quickly. It's kind of shaped like a makeup brush. In the round family, you're going to see something a lot like this camel hair brush. It's an example of a round brush, but it's a little bit more blunt on the top. Doesn't come to a good point. Kalinsky Sable Blend, this is called a pointed round. This is a fan brush, great for grasses and fur. This is another fan brush, but this is in um, my ivory or synthetic bristle. Now I'm gonna show you two flats. This is a flat brush. You can see it has fairly long bristles and then that nice blade to it. This shorter flat is called a bright and all of these shapes are brushes that you're gonna find when choosing um, between watercolor, oil, or acrylic. It's all the same terminology. This is another beautiful brush, a pointed round. Now for me, that's really important when um, working with detailed brushes to have one that has a pretty good belly to it and then comes to a nice point. This is in my line of brushes. This is my Kalinsky Sable once again. As you might come across something called a rigger or a liner, it's a brush that has really long bristles. Now, when doing long, elegant lines like long branches, long blades of grass, um, telephone wires, or masts on a sailboat, 
you're going to want a brush that holds a lot of paint so that you can do one continuous line without any disruption and having to reload your brush. That is the purpose of a rigger or a liner. Because of that really unusual length to the bristle, it can hold quite a lot of paint and I recommend filling it right to the ferrule, something that I recently added to my kit on occasion, especially when plein air painting is a dagger brush. Like you can work with natural hair or synthetic. Um, it just gives me a really fun and a flexible, characterful strokes, and I can really manipulate the edges to it. So it's a new addition to my toolkit. I don't always have it in there, but you may see it in some of my future tutorials. One of the most um, important brushes is my Filbert brush. Once again, this is the ivory bristle, so it's synthetic. And look how thin that is. What I love about this brush is because it's synthetic, it doesn't hold a lot of paint. And as odd as that sounds, this makes it the perfect brush for mixing paint in my palette. You never ever want to use a natural hair brush when mixing paint in your palette because it really can wear down the bristles. This guy is super duper resilient. Those stiff, coarse bristles and the fact that it's synthetic make it um, a really tough little workhorse. It's shaped like a little paddle. It easily scoops up paint and distributes into the palette. Um, I absolutely love this brush. You'll see me talk about this in almost every single one of my tutorials when we start mixing our paint. There's a lot less paint waste with this brush. There's one more brush that you may want to consider adding to your toolbox, especially when plein air painting, and that's called a pocket brush or a travel brush. And it's quite a beautiful design. What you're gonna see here is like this bullet casing and the brush is hidden inside and it flips right around so that it forms a full-sized handle. Now, what you wanna look for in a travel brush is one that has the lid click into place and it doesn't come loose from that. It really should have some sort of little knob on it um, that will allow this to snap and grab onto the end of the brush. If it doesn't do that, um, it's sort of pointless because the last thing you wanna be doing is either painting with a little stumpy brush or having your paintbrush fall off onto your surface. So that's an important feature. Just test it to make sure that it clicks into place properly. Of course, like the other brushes that I showed you, um, a double crimped ferrule is a huge bonus. Now, the beautiful thing about this particular one and also something that you should look for is when you're traveling, you don't have time to dry your brushes necessarily. And so it's probably going to be going back into your toolkit wet. So the nice thing about this um, brush is that it has a hole in the lid. So when it goes back on, um, the brush can air out and it won't end up uh, collecting mold or mildew on the bristles, which is definitely something that you want to avoid. Now, I can't put the lid back on when this is fluffy and I've seen many people try to do that. It's a really bad idea. All you have to do is make sure that it's going back into the casing wet. As you can see here, I'll wet the brush. And this is a beautiful Kalinsky Sable brush. So it just, boom, went right back to the point right away. So I just make sure that all of my little bristles are contained in the shape and then I just easily can slide this cap back on in one go. Et voila! In my kit, I've got my one inch natural hair sable brush. I've got a number one Kalinsky sable round I have my number 10 hybrid, which is half synthetic, half Kalinsky Sable. And it's like having three brushes in one. So I can skip right over this and go right to my number one. I don't need any filler brushes in between. On the synthetic side, I use my fan brush for grasses, trees, splattering, dry brush. It uh, stays so beautifully splayed, even when it's wet. And that's something to look for in a fan brush is one that stays splayed and spiky and doesn't clump together when you're working with it. 
my filbert, which is great for lifting curvy round shapes from my watercolor, but also I use this as my mixing brush. My flats, which I use for lifting and dry brush and masking broad areas. And then my number six round, which I use for round areas that I might want to mask. And then once again, my rigor liner. I both paint with this and mask with this. Any of these synthetic brushes are perfect for masking, including this rigor. In fact, this is an absolute dream to mask with. And I use that over a skewer, even those masking fluid pens. I love using the rigor because it gives me a little bit more character and um, I have a lot more control over how much masking fluid I put on my brush versus using a stick or a nib. When you first purchase a brand new brush, you may find that there's this little plastic tube on the end. Um, I highly suggest that you do away with this once you get home. Really, this tube is just meant to help protect it during the shipping process and while it's at the store. Um, just take the tube off and get rid of that <laughs> once you get home. We'll talk a little bit later about how to properly store your brush if you're concerned about um, keeping that beautiful shape. The other thing that you probably notice is that it's very likely, especially in the higher end brushes, to have a little bit of sizing on the brush. It just keeps the bristles rigid and um, protects it during the shipping process. But fear not, once you get home, you can take that brush, wet the bristles, and it will be that soft, supple brush of your dreams. At the end of your painting session, it's important to store your brushes properly. So you certainly never want the brush to dry with paint on it. It can not only stain the bristles, um, but it can eat away at the integrity of the brush. So it definitely needs to go away clean. You don't have to use warm water or even soap, but you can use just tempered water. Um, so something that is just sort of uh, room temperature is ideal. Now this brush is dry, but if I wanted to retain its shape while it is um, unused, I could wet the brush. You certainly want to wipe any excess water away from your brush. And if you want, you can take some natural soap, glycerin soap or brush cleaner. It conditions the bristles, um, but also helps to kind of mold it back into that beautiful, pristine shape. It's totally optional. This is an extra step. If you're in a studio environment and you want to store your brushes upright, you certainly can do so. Now, the only thing is if you're storing your brush upright, uh, you do want to make sure that as much water is out of that as possible because the water can travel down the ferrule and end up cracking and busting the wooden handle. This brush is a perfect example of what happens when you leave your brush sitting in water in the cup or you don't dry your brush as much as possible and you leave it storing upright in a cup. So in both cases, the water can travel down the ferrule and get absorbed by the wooden handle and bloat the wood and bust off your paint. And it can also loosen the glue on your ferrule. So Make sure that you're always drying your brushes and putting them away carefully until the next time you're ready to paint. You can use bamboo mats, uh, sew two placemats together that have little pocketed slots. Um, my preference is to keep them in a case like this because it has a zippered pouch and it keeps the brushes from sliding out. I've been teaching for over 25 years and I've seen a lot of students lose their brushes in those rolled up cases because they slide out the top. So that zipper just offers a little bit of extra containment and I think is a huge asset. What I love about this particular um, construction is that it's quite rigid. So there's no concern with my brushes getting broken or bent while in storage. And I take this one traveling with me as well. I think it's absolutely brilliant. There's so many pockets to it here. I can keep my brushes nice and organized and in place. And I've got so many slots. I can use pencils. I've even got an extra pocket that I can store my um, pens when I'm doing pen and ink and even erasers as well. So lots of room for multiple different styles and sizes of brushes. And then finally, I can just close it up 
and zip it up and there's no chance of losing any brushes. And then because this is not an airtight container, any extra humidity that was left in the bristles can escape freely. And once again, we don't want mold or mildew building up on our brushes. So um, you can check out the links below for my recommendation for a brush case just like this. If you like this kind of content, be sure to comment, to like, and even hit that super thanks for me, which is down below. That really helps to support me and allows me to continue creating this free content for you right here on my art channel. Thanks for watching everybody and happy painting as always. See you the next time.